for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblechamp.com or lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thursday afternoon, June 26, 1980. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Conference Ground, Summer Family Camp Meeting. It's being held in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Maxwell White is the teacher of the afternoon, speaking on the power of the blood. The message that I'm going to give this afternoon is the counterbalance on deliverance. You know, I taught you the other day that you need a counterbalance on everything. Otherwise, if you don't, you swing too far the one way. Now, in the deliverance ministry, many people get driven into a kind of fear. Because in the first place, uh, they get afraid of the devil, they get afraid of lurking demons, and they get afraid lest they've done something in the past that will be binding them in the present, and so they get into a bind. Now, the message that I'm going to give this afternoon is the counterbalance. It is the power of the blood. I myself, I, 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 I think I'll just tell on it right now before I get into the message on the blood. But I myself was delivered of two major things in my life before the message of deliverance was known. In 1939, I came into contact with a full gospel group in England, and on my mother's side, my dear old grandfather, he went to church every Sunday, but all his children were totally engrossed in, in spiritism of some form, of occult. One of my aunts was a practicing witch. Uh, she didn't call herself that, she called herself a medium. And uh, my eldest uncle, as I was given to understand, was one of the pioneers of hypnotism, clinically, he was a medical doctor. And all this thing was right through my family. On Sunday afternoons, I was a, a young fellow, about seven, eight, and nine, my aunt, my, the, 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 the medium aunt, would come round and talk to my mother. She had a, a compulsive talking spirit. There is such a thing. You probably met them sometimes. They start off and you just can't get a word in from then on out. Well, she was talking all the time about her experiences with those who'd gone before, you see. And here was I playing under the table, listening to all this stuff, absorbing it into my mind. And then at the age of ten... My grandfather was a very wealthy man, and he, he quite literally lived in a mansion. And in this mansion, the family used to gather every, every uh, Christmas time, and they used to have a huge um, mahogany table. And so, at this Christmas time, one of my uncles said, Well, now, what shall we do? So someone else said, Well, let's have some table wrapping. Uh, if you don't know what that is, I won't bother to tell you, but the demons tap under the table, and, and it's, like, it's like a Ouija board in a different form. And after we had had that a little bit, uh, then we had a little bit of levitation, and I was introduced into this. You put one finger, two people put one finger under the armpit of a person, and up they go by the power of the power of evil spirit. I did that. Well, then they said, well, now let's have some... Uh, uh, let's have some move the table ask the spirits to move the table so this big table this big mahogany table I said to mother can, can I take place in this so my uncle said well alright won't do the boy any harm he's ten years old now he's got to understand these things so we put fingertip to fingertip all the way around this big table and then uh, one of my uncles commanded the spirits to make it move you see well of course I was absolutely thrilled to bits when this uh, table began to move across the room and it moved from about here to about that wall. And then my, one of my uncles said, well, what shall we tell uh, the spirits to do now? So one of them said, well, how about telling the spirits to make the table walk up the wall? I thought, well, this is really interesting. So, you know, I held on in great anticipation and that, that table began to slide. It must have weighed about half a ton. And just with us keeping our fingers on, it began to crawl up the wall. Now, these are the experiences that I had as a young boy. Not due to my fault, but due to my, my mother's fault. My father had never had anything to do with it. And my uncles and aunts' fault. There were a lot of them. 
They were all in this occult business. Without knowing it, of course, you will understand that I collected an evil spirit, an occult spirit, which you can't touch the devil without him imparting something to you, because Paul says, give no place to the devil. And if you give your hand to the devil, he'll shake it and hold on. When I came into the knowledge of the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, and I was convicted in my heart, naturally there were quite a number of things that had to be cleared up. And nobody had to come along and tell me about that. The Holy Spirit showed me. See, I'm afraid that many, many men today are trying to do the work of the Holy Spirit. You get that in the discipling movement. They're taking the place of the Holy Spirit and telling people what to do. Now, people come to me and say, what shall I do? I said, well, you look in the Word of God and you pray about it, and the Holy Spirit will tell you what to do. I'm telling you these things to keep everything in holy balance. So, in, in due course of time, um, I decided that I would go along to what they called uh, a seeking meeting in those days. And the idea was that we should seek the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So, I went along, and in this meeting... They taught the pleading of the blood. Now, you may not understand the exact semantics on this, but anyway, it's honoring the blood, repeating the word blood, singing about the blood. And, uh, of course, I knew nothing about this at all, and they, and they said, well, Brother White, if you want to receive the baptism of the Spirit, you better just kneel down there. And uh, so I obediently knelt down, my elbows on a chair and my knees on the ground, and they all began, they said, plead the blood, Brother White. No way was I going to plead the blood. No, sir, I had demon inside me. I didn't know. So uh, they began pleading the blood and singing about the blood and praising the Lord, you see, uh, while I and one or two others were supposed to be receiving the baptism of the Spirit. Now, the, the praising and the pleading of the blood did it. All of a sudden, and I was a very respectable businessman, all of a sudden, to my astonishment, my body began to straighten out like a, uh, like a ramrod. My elbow slipped off the chair. I slipped flat on my face. And like a stiff, as a, a stiff as a ball on the floor and I was exceedingly embarrassed and then without me knowing it watch this without any other visible manifestation the occult spirit left me this is why not all falling down under the power is the Holy Spirit it's the Holy Spirit moving upon a person and then the demon throws them to the ground or they throw them to they throw themselves to the ground, which is psychologically of being slain in the spirit. <laughs> Some people think you can't get a blessing until you fall over. But I'm speaking from a heart of experience. I could teach you so many things if I was here longer. Anyway, next week, I had a much, much greater hunger for the Holy Spirit. So they had another speaking meeting next week. To this I went, and this time I joined in the feeding of the blood, the honoring of the blood, and within a very short time, I had one of the greatest baptisms in the Spirit that anyone has ever had. I thought I was going to take off. And I heard myself speaking in a, in a foreign language. My whole life was literally charged with the glory of God because the evil spirit had first been cast out of me. Now, that was done without the imposition of hand. That was done by honoring the blood and praising God in the presence of those people who were doing it. See, I want to show you, you don't have to get all excited to get delivered. Neither do you have to get all condemned to be delivered. Just go into the presence of people praising God, and you can be delivered. Well, it wasn't very long, of course, I realized also just before this happened, uh, the previous deliverance was that, like so many people, uh, I had been a very heavy smoker. Now, I didn't have to have anyone come up to me and say, Brother White, you stink. I knew that. Um, or to be rude to me in any way, the Holy Spirit showed me that I couldn't ask for the Holy Spirit, uh, I shouldn't ask for the Holy Spirit to come in if I was defiling the temple of God. Now the Holy Spirit taught me that. No one had told me. If only we'd listen a little bit more to him and not to one another, we wouldn't get so cross, cross current confusion. There's an awful lot of cross current confusion going on in the deliverance ministry generally. One person has this idea, another person has that idea, and you get somebody being prayed for, and half a dozen people come along, and he's got a spirit of this, he's got a spirit of that, and he's got a spirit of something else, and he's got a spirit of something else, and the end of the whole place blows up in confusion. It needs to be under control of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, I have been having very unusual experiences of the Holy Spirit before I was baptized in the Spirit. I would be driving my car along the streets of London, and all of a sudden I felt like I wanted to go through the roof. And I would be walking along the streets of London, and all of a sudden the sidewalk would do this. 
And uh, I figured it was something to do with the Holy Spirit, but I don't know quite how. So I went along and told my friends, and they said, well, praise God, Brother White, you are having anointing for the Spirit. So I knew what they were theologically and experientially. Well, I was very uh, unhappy about the smoking business, and I tried to give it up my own strength, and you know you can't do that. So I got more in condemnation about this. And then uh, one day I was lying in bed, meditating on some of these amazing things that I had come into contact with. And then I had one of these anointings, and it came down upon me, and, 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 uh, and I heard, I remember a couple of cars outside who honked their horns, and it was like a way, way, way in the distance. I was surrounded by the anointing and the glory of God lying in my bed. And then I said, that's it, Lord. This is the time. Please, Lord, take away this smoking habit. And as I did so, the hand of the Lord reached down, and it felt like a heavy sap being taken clean out clean from me. And with the same voice that I said, please deliver me, Lord, I said, thank you, Lord. I went to sleep. I woke up in the morning without the smell of burning upon me, just like the Hebrew used. There wasn't a smell of smoke. There wasn't a desire to smoke. My, my wife saw a miracle to take in place, and she was deeply affected by it, because she was fighting against the Holy Ghost at that time. So what I want to tell you this, friends, is this that I had two major deliverances in my life without anyone praying for me. Major deliverances. I had a minor one later, I'll tell you about that. And these are the only deliverances basically that I've ever experienced. I may, may need some more, I wouldn't deny that, but I'm not conscious at the moment that I do need any. If you discern any you want to pray with me, you're welcome. Now, at the beginning of my ministry, I suffered a cyclic six-day migraine headache. And uh, it didn't matter what I did, or, or, or that sure enough, if this came on Saturday night or Sunday morning, it was a disaster if I had to preach. So I was praying, and I was asking the Lord, and I told you this the other night, don't go keep on going to other people for an opinion. Ask Jesus. The gifts of the Spirit are there for you. You may get a wrong opinion from another person. He may be all mixed up on it. He may know what he's talking about. He may try and operate the gift of the Word of knowledge and give you the gift of the Word of garbage. That's right. I mean, I know that these things are happening. I, I asked the Lord. The Lord gave me a word of knowledge. He always does it. I asked him. And I'm no exceptional person. The Lord said, y you, you remember when you were a boy of seven, you had <laughs> yellow jaundice, sometimes called hepatitis? I said, yes, Lord. He said, you remember you were very, very seriously sick and your mother was worried? I said, yes, Lord. When he said, at that time, when your liver was weakened by this germ, three evil spirits came into your liver. This is the cause of your headaches. So I said, thank you, Lord. So then I got three men in the church, and I said, you brethren, I want you to cast the demon out of my liver. Well, they were horrified. Absolutely horrified. I mean, pastors don't have demons. Uh, and so I said, go on, man. I said, don't hang back. Put your hands on me and rebuke these spirits of infirmity in my liver. But very gingerly, Father, in Jesus' name, we, we rebuke the spirit of infirmity in our pastor. Come out, in Jesus' name. And I went, boop, 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 and I've never had any headaches since. So, you know, there's a very real sense in which some people do get terrified at this ministry. And so, we've got to remember that the counterbalance is using, using the protection of the blood of Jesus consciously. I'm going to go through this now. It'll take about 50 minutes from now. My first scripture is found in Leviticus chapter 11. That's right in the law. I love Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is simply a repetition of the law of Leviticus. That's what Deuter means, second. In Leviticus chapter 17, there's the law of the blood. And if the thing is in the law of God in the Old Covenant, it has its fulfillment under the New Covenant. Remember that. In fact, the such words are used, and this shall be a statute for you uh, forever. So this is a statute that's for us forever. So let's read one verse only, Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul. I want to discuss these three words, blood, atonement, soul. It is a biological fact, and you ask any doctor, that life is in your blood. The blood is a carrier. 
And as the blood is pumped down by the heart, in the life, in the blood, is your life. And as long as your blood touches your brain or your feet or whatever, it is carrying your personal biological life. That's from the Greek word bios, biological life, which is traveling around your body. The moment your motor stops, the car stops. It's out of gas. The moment your heart stops, you're dead. But you may have all the original blood in your body. You see, now here's a trick question coming. I throw them now and again just to, uh, just to check your ignorance. <laughs> Who was the first person to be resurrected in the Bible? Now I know Brother Mel Amrine, Brother W.A. know the answer to this one. Who was the first person to be resurrected in the Bible? Shout it out if you know it. No? You're all talking at once, I'll tell you. The first person to be resurrected in the Bible was Adam. Because the word resurrection in the Greek, anastasis, means to stand on your feet. Now when God made the first man, Adam, he lay on the ground, he was a perfect specimen of manhood. Say ladies, God made man first, how about that? He lay on the ground, he had blood in his body, he had an, a, a, a heart, and everything equipped to function as a perfect human being. One to say, yes, a perfect son of God. And then along came the Lord by his spirit. He breathed into Adam the breath of life. And Adam became a living soul. So now you know what a soul is. Not something spooky. Adam was the first created soul. Spirit, soul, and body. The moment that God breathed, the pump started to work. The blood circulated around the body, and Adam was as fully alive as if he ha ever had been. And if Adam hadn't have sinned, he would have gone on living forever. Now, the next word we need to carefully explain, it is atonement. Now, the word atonement is, I think, in a sense, a manufactured word. It reads, at one myth. This is the way the Christian scientists use it. We become at one with God. But the literal Hebrew doesn't carry that thought at all. The literal Hebrew means a covering. And there is no alternate word to look it up in a concordance. Sometimes in a concordance they'll give you two or three alternate meanings of the Greek or Hebrew. But there's only one meaning of this word. It is a covering. So the blood that comes to us a covering. Now what is a covering? Well the roof is a covering if it rains. An umbrella is a covering if it rains. A raincoat is a covering if it rains. Why do we build tabernacles like this? Because sometimes the rain comes down in deluges. We wouldn't all want to get wet. Some of us are anyway, but we don't want to get more wet. And so we have a covering. Well now God has so equipped human nature, knowing the ever omnipresent, not omnipresence, but the ever-present power of Satan, who is the prince of this world, and you can get up to the moon, but he's still the prince of, this air, so of the air, so you can't get away from him. But while the devil and all his multitudes of demon spirits are all around us at all times, in form sometimes, God has given us an impenetrable, impervious covering. I call it impenetrable and impervious. It is not possible for Satan to get through that covering, providing you put your umbrella up. And that's where this message comes in. This is not a theological message on the fact of the blood being shed for our redemption. That's another message. This is a message on the practical using of the blood of Jesus Christ today. You say, well, where is it? On the altar in heaven. When Jesus died, he came back again after three days and appeared to Mary. And Mary rushed forward and would have put her arms round his ankle. But he said, Mary, touch me not. I've not yet ascended to my father. Now, why did he have to ascend to his father? Because under the old covenant, every high priest had to take the blood into the holiest of all and then return back to announce the fact to the children of Israel that their sins had been covered for one more year. And so Jesus, our eternal high priest, was the had to go into the holiest of all, which is heaven itself, with his own blood. 
and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat in heaven. Now don't ask me what the mercy seat looks like in heaven. I don't know. One day I'll tell you up there, but at the moment I do not know. Some people have all kinds of guessing games when they get into these things. Sufficient to know there is a mercy seat in heaven. Sufficient to say it's covered with the glory of God. Sufficient to say that it stands there eternally, and on that mercy seat, Jesus Christ sprinkled his blood, and in Hebrews we read that the blood of Jesus Christ speaketh, speaketh, it's living, better things than the blood of Abel. You've got the two bloods in the Bible. The blood of murder and the blood of sacrifice. And you're either going to have one or the other. So the blood of Jesus Christ exists in heaven. And I've got a lovely piece so how can I get in heaven? Oh, there's no problem there at all. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read the beautiful scripture. I was discussing this with a brother earlier today. Verse 19, Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. And I'll comment on this a little bit before going into Genesis. I'm getting my message a little bit mixed up, but it doesn't matter. It's consequent as far as my mind is concerned this afternoon. Verse 19 through 21, Hebrews 10. Of course, Hebrews 9, 10, and 11 are the study chapters in the New Testament about the blood. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You see that? The moment Jesus shed his blood, the moment he cried out, it is finished, you remember what happened? A six-inch a six inch veil was ripped from top to bottom in the temple. Never been known in the history of Israel. When Jesus shed his blood, breaking the veil, that is to say his flesh, the veil in the temple correspondingly broke wide open and the way into the holiest is now made manifest for any one of us who wants to go and talk to Jesus. By a new and a living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed from pure water. This is where we talk about the sprinkling of the blood. Now, do you realize every time you go to Holy Communion, what you're doing, most people don't, it's a kind of, kind of ritual. You go through the ritual. You go to Mass, it's a ritual. But it's more than a ritual. When you take that communion wine, and pour it in your mouth, you are sprinkling it upon your heart. Because the heart in the Bible speaks of the place where your spirit is, and speaks, the heart includes the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, the bowels, the reproductive organs and everything is your very sensitive area of your body, and it is from the heart that you think every evil thing comes out of the heart. You know, Jesus told us that, evil eye, your fornication and so on, murder, all come out of the heart. So, when you go to the Holy Communion, you are actually sprinkling, by faith, the blood of Jesus Christ upon an evil conscience. That's why you're supposed to, the Roman Catholics teach you to get a confession on Saturday night, and that's not a bad idea, if it isn't a routine confession. See? But you're supposed to examine yourself. Examine yourself, not somebody else. Have you ever noticed how many times you're always examining somebody else? We are using the blood when we go to Holy Communion service. Now get that. We're using it. And this is the message. Now, let's go from here right into the book of Genesis. Because what's in the book of Genesis, I believe, is fulfilled uh, in the last days uh, of, that we're living in right now. All kinds of things in Genesis are being fulfilled today. Um, now, Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden. They were state created in a state of innocency. That's to say they didn't know the difference between right and wrong. Uh, but in the midst of the paradise of God was, or were, two trees. One was the tree of life, who is Jesus Christ, who is symbolic of Jesus Christ. The other was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is the university in the, in the, uh, in the place. And uh, to Adam, the head of the, the, head of the wife, I'm sure you all agreed with that principle, right? To Adam was given the law, thou shalt not touch or taste of the fruit of that one tree. All the other trees are yours. All their fruit and blossoms are yours. Taste of them and eat of them freely. But of that tree thou shalt not touch. Adam said, yes sir, I understand. 
He told his wife Eve. His wife said, yes, Adam, I understand. Good. Well, one day along comes Satan. He's still there. He's still here. There isn't an Arkansas devil, you know. He's a universal one. And he said, uh, hello, Eve. She says, hi. He said, be enjoying yourself? Sure am. Um, by the way, Eve, have you seen that tree over there? Wait, which that one? Yeah. Well, that's the tree of the knowledge good needle. Yes, I know. He said, you know, Eve, that if you tasted that fruit, you'll know the difference between good and evil, and you'll be like gods. You'll be like gods. Not like God. Like God. She said, is that so? Mm-hmm. Don't you think it looks nice? It does. Wouldn't you like to taste it? No, I can't do so. Why? Because God told me that I mustn't eat it or even touch it. Eve, come on now. Have you got that in writing? Did you take a tape recording of that? Are you sure you understood the Greek tense, right? Got all confused. But you know, friends, whether it's man or woman, if God tells you to do something, not to do something, you know when you were a kid, that's exactly the thing you went and did? You got in trouble, didn't you? So did she. So she went to touch. That was enough. The light went out. Adam came along. said, what have you done? She explained what she'd done. She said, Adam, husband, join me in this. Do you know, there's a beautiful fire here. Somebody say, well, why did Adam blow it too? You see, Eve should have gone to Adam and asked his permission whether or not she should eat the fruit. Come on, no ERA there. But she didn't. She didn't. She acted in a matriarchal manner and not a patriarchal manner. And so now Adam realized that if he did not also do what she did, he'd have lost his wife. Here is a most beautiful type of Jesus Christ in Christ, identifying himself with his wife, the church. Jesus Christ, for a fulfillment of Adam, took part in his wife's sin, identified himself with his wife's sin. And you know what the Bible says? A curse. He was the fulfillment of the brazen, brassy serpent lifted up in the wilderness on a pole. And he himself said that as the serpent was lifted up, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Total identification with the sins of the whole world, that out of the world he might bring a bride for himself. That's why he partook. And then you know they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They looked at each other, and they'd never seen each other naked before. Never, because they were clothed with light. Everywhere they walked in the cool of the evening, communing to God, you'd have seen two shining ones. That's all you'd have seen, two shining ones. No nakedness. That comes in the book of Revelation about the church of Laodicea, finding that you're naked. They are, too. For then, it is normal, ladies. It is natural, ladies. That if you were suddenly caught unclothed, to cover up. You'd grab a towel, or you'd do this, or... Whatever was at hand, you'd cover yourself up. That is normal to a normal human being, unless the devil gets hold of you, and then you go in for all this nudism and exposure and going down on the beach with a uh, banana leaf on you and uh, just about it. <laughs> That's sin. That's demonic. That is demonic infestation. So Eve turned around immediately and she saw a fig tree beside her. So she grabbed several, quickly she could, several fig leaves, knotted them together with pieces of grass, put them on herself, and then made one for Adam. He put it on himself. Then they looked at each other and probably laughed. And this, my friends, was the most foolish thing that a human being could do. Because if anybody knows that by tomorrow, the fig trees in the heat of the Garden of Eden, the fig leaves, would be uh, reduced to powdery and they'd all disintegrate. So the works of man... The righteousness of man, the covering of the righteousness of man, is futile. You cannot cover your nakedness by yourself. It's a fig tree religion. We've got many of those. That's they call humanism in America today. So God, when he saw that man had tried his best and blown it, said, now, you just leave this to me, will you? And there's just one verse in the whole Bible given to this beautiful act. It's verse 21 of Genesis 3. Just one verse. You can underline it if you wish. Genesis 3 and verse 21. And unto Adam also, and to his wife, 
did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now, Adam loved those animals. He named every one of them. They were his friends. He could go and talk to lions and tigers and these animals and stroke them because the lion will lay down with the lamb again one day in the millennium. But that was the condition that was existing then. He loved these animals and he saw God take one of these animals, kill it, shed its blood. The lesson was coming through without the shedding of blood. There is no remission. Shed its blood, ripped off its skins, made, he made it all by himself. He made a covering. And that's the meaning of the word eternal. By the shedding of blood, he gave them garments of skin. By the shedding of his blood on the cross of Calvary, he gives us garments of righteousness by the shedding of his blood. The blood supplies a covering. Quickly going on, because there's so much to tell you in this in a short time. I, there were a few of my books left, but I'm going to ask that an order be placed for a much larger number in the future. Um, <clears throat> let's go to... Exodus 12, and see how the, the known law of shedding blood and sprinkling blood was then used by God in the Exodus. And there's another message that I could preach sometime on the second Exodus of the church from its Egyptian bondage. The church is now being, it's going in an Exodus right now. We've already heard in this conference that some people are moving out moving on towards far greater things than we have experienced up to the present time. It's the perfecting of the church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. We might all, all see to eye to eye in the, in, the, in the final state of this, but it's coming and it's happening. Amen. Now, the children of Israel were in a dreadful state. In fact, I was reading today, this very day, in my comfortable upper room, which Irma has supplied me, and... Uh, Poor old Moses, poor old Moses. Verse 22 and 23 of Exodus chapter 5, you like to read it. Why it takes some time, why the, the, the deliverance ministry takes a long time to come in, or it takes a long time to sink in sometimes with people, because there are opposing demonic forces literally opposing you being delivered. Listen to these. 5, Exodus 5, reading from verse 20. The children of Israel met Moses and Aaron who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. They'd been into Pharaoh to tell him to let the children of Israel go, which is deliverance. And they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge. Moses was on the hot seat. Because you have made our savour to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou dealt so evil, how well hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. There came a time in this recent year when God brought the deliverance ministry back to New Testament Israel that they might be delivered from the modern pharaohs today. And that's another message. We're just touching on it. But it was finally accomplished by blood. There would have been no deliverance if it hadn't have been the final promise of the death of the firstborn. In those days they understood the meaning of that word because the firstborn of every children of Israel family was the, was the priest of that family. That came later changed to the Levites. But in this day it was the, head, it was the eldest member of every family, the firstborn. And so God said in verse 21 of Exodus 12, Exodus 12, And Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, that's a disinfectant weed, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel at the top, and the two side posts, with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door, and will not suffer the destroyer, Satan, 
to come in unto your houses to smite you. Every member of every family, and it's reckoned they invited uncles and aunts down the road and grandma and grandma living alone down the road, there are about 15 persons per family on this map. An average of 15 out of two and a half million. Each one, the head of each family, the, high, the priest of that family, had to kill a sacrificial lamb which speaks of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And then they were to take the blood and put it on the lintel and the side post of the house. And then they said to everybody from grandma and grandpa down to the uh, smallest infant, they were required to pass in under the blood. And having passed in under the blood, they were told to abide there until the morning, for at night the enemy bombers would come over and rain down death upon the firstborn. And there was darkness throughout the land of Egypt, but there was light in the homes of the children of Israel. The blood had switched on that light again. But you know what happened? The Lord kept his promise. The children of Israel were delivered. They had been given no pay for years. They had worked as slaves. So if God gave them favor, they went in and they got all that pay. They got the earrings, they got the bracelets, they got the gold, they got the silver. They stripped the Egyptians and went clean out. I like that. Glory to God. <coughs> Deliverance through the using of blood. Now we'll go to Leviticus 14 now. Right into the very law now. This uh, uh, teaching began in the Garden of Eden delivered the children of Israel, and is now in the law of God. Chapter 14 of Leviticus, verse 13, or verse 12, And the priest shall take one he lamb, and offer him for a trespass offering, and the log of oil, and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. You will notice that blood and oil are coupled here, and I'll have a word to say about that. <laughs> verse 13, And he shall slay the lamb in the place where he shall kill the sin offering, and the burnt offering, all of this speaks of Jesus, our sin offering and our burnt offering, in the holy place. For as the sin offering is the priest's, so the, is the trespass offering, it is most holy. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering. Jesus died for our sins. And the priest, the high priest, shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. Now why? This was the ordination ceremony. Every priest in Israel was ordained by having blood put on the ear, the thumb, and the toe. Why? Friends, I have already warned you of the danger of television. I've already told you I have, I, I said three, actually I have four television sets, and they're all colored. So I'm not against television sets, not against radio in any form. But, there's a danger in anything if that comes between you and God. You can receive demons by watching television through your eyes. And my son, who's now got the pastorship of the church, he monitors, and so does my wife, we both monitor the television guide, and if there's something interesting on of an edifying nature, maybe a National Geographic special, or maybe a religious program, or uh, maybe something that is instructive. We'll say, well, we'll listen to that. We'll look at that. But we monitor it. And I advise you all to monitor it. And so, look at all the junk. I remember one time, I was listening, I was in my office one day, and I had a, we got two good music programs in Toronto, and I love good music. And I usually had good music playing, either by record or by radio, and I had this radio station on. And this, suddenly it switched into a, a talk about some blue movie. And uh, I wasn't paying any attention to it, when all of a sudden, one of the ladies, I should say, quote, lady, unquote, that was giving the commentary used a four-letter word meaning sexual intercourse. Well, I knew the meaning of that word because I had served an apprenticeship years ago as an engineer. And they, that's the kind of language that they talk. So I knew the meaning of the word. I didn't use it. And so I was so shocked. The Holy Spirit in me so revolted at hearing on public radio a dirty four-letter word that I wrote to the station. I believe we're required to do that with the body of Christ. So they wrote back and said, Oh, no, this word is in common usage today. It's accepted. Well, it might be by him, but it wasn't by me. 
So then I wrote to the Board of Broadcast Governors, which is the equivalent to your FCC, made my complaint to them. They got in touch with the radio station, confirmed it, wrote the same kind of foolish letter to me. So I wrote back to the, to the Board of Broadcast Governors and I said, if that is so, then I as a preacher can use that four-letter word in my sermons. Of course, even they wouldn't agree to that. And so you see, there's a lot of dirt that comes through radio and television today. There is. There is. Don't kid yourself. It's dirt. And so, in order that we might be protected, God says, put the blood of Jesus Christ on your ear. Now, you know very well the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin, don't you? I mean, we're taught that in Hebrew. But when you, you, I said you, or maybe your father, put the blood of Jesus Christ by faith. How do you do it? Faith. By faith, in the name of Jesus, I apply his precious blood to your ear. Now you've got a bloody ear. And whatever hits that ear under the blood, notice under the blood, you know that song, we're under the blood, the precious blood. You know that song, don't you? The evil, the dirt, the filth, hits that ear under the blood and dies. Dies. If you're doing it deliberately, it enters. On the right thumb, I tell you the things that we do with our hair. When Paul says, give no place to the devil, you know, much of the place that people give to the devil is in the hand. Think of the dirty things you do with your hand. And to get sort of a little bit down to earth, there wouldn't be any divorce at any time if it wasn't the hand starting it all. You know that? Fornication starts with the hand. Healing starts with the hands. Drunkenness starts with the hands. Broking starts with the hands. Fighting starts with the hands. And so... The Word of God says, I'll fix this for you, my beloved. Just put the blood of my Son on the right thumb of your right hand. I told you the other day, I don't know whether I shocked anyone, but I meant it. If I had time and they invited me to go to a cocktail party, I'd go to it. But I'd go to tell them about Jesus, and my right hand would be used in drinking orange juice. See? A sanctified hand and a sanctified body, the temple of the Holy Ghost. Look at the things you can do with your hair. You can go up to a man, be he a, or a woman, or be there a believer or a non-believer. It doesn't make any difference. And I prefer it with non-believers. You go up to an unbeliever, look him square in the eye, be as friendly as, you, as Jesus would be, and put out your right hand. He takes it. You say, God bless you, my friend. That's better than cursing him. Especially if he's done you harm. Do you know what you're doing? You're putting his hand under the blood. And you are imparting to him a blessing. A blessing under the blood. And you know, friends, if you do that with an unbeliever, he'll never be the same again. And it may be the very first trigger that leads to his conversion. A hand under the blood. What part of you came into this building first this evening, this afternoon? Probably your right toe. It sticks out. Some people stick out a little bit more than others. But it sticks out above all the rest, doesn't it? Blood on your right toe. So that wherever you go, the moment you enter that home, you're bringing the peace of Jesus Christ, shalom. That's why Jesus said, my peace be unto you. You walk in with his peace, and the first thing that enters that home is your toe under the blood. That house, from that moment, becomes sanctified under the blood of Jesus Christ as long as you stay there. Which is why, at work, those people who tried this and proved it, if you work in an ungodly environment and you keep on praising the Lord and you keep on loving your fellow man, never criticizing him, suddenly the swearing begins to stop, the cussing begins to stop, the face becomes to be slowly sanctified. It's true. It's absolutely true and it works every time. I'll go into Leviticus 1. You know, some people say, well, Jesus Christ was the only one who sprinkled his blood. Yes, that's true. But I'll show you how we can partake of it. Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 5. And he shall kill the bullock. Jesus is also a type of the bullock, you know. He's a, he's a sheep, he's a lamb, he's a bullock, he's a door, he's a ram, he's a ram's horn. He's all these kind of things. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's son, 
shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about and upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Again in verse 11. And he shall kill it on the side of the altar northwards before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's sons shall sprinkle his blood round about upon the altar. We are Aaron's sons. We are sons of the high priest Jesus. We are sons of God. And it is our privilege to take of the blood from the high priest Jesus and sprinkle it. There used to be a lady years ago in the early days of Pentecost called Mrs. Newsom. Some of her writings are still existing. I think you can get them from the Assemblies of God Publishing House in Springfield. And she teaches quite correctly, because it used to be taught in the very early days of Pentecost. It was then, like so many other things in Pentecost, it gave way to entertainment. And she used to teach, and here's this for mothers with wayward sons. Sprinkle the blood of Jesus Christ upon your children daily. You do it. Sprinkle it upon them. When you go out in your automobile, sprinkle the blood of Jesus Christ by faith upon your automobile. I do more than that. When I go on a trip with my wife, I say, now Lord, before we go, I take of your precious blood, I sprinkle it upon this car, and now Lord, I invite you to send your angels to have charge over me as I travel on the highway. And brother, I've got news for you, they've never missed. Praise God. I've never had a serious bump in over 40 years. There are many, many scriptures on this. Uh, let's turn to Leviticus 9, which again is more about, more about Aaron's sons. Leviticus 9, 12 and 18, I'll just read. And he slew the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood, which he sprinkled round about the altar. Then in verse 18, he slew also the bullock and the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings, which was for the people, and Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood which he sprinkled upon the altar round about. Verse 23 and 24, and Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. Then came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat which when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. That's really being slain in the spirit. And it was all occasioned by sprinkling blood. Are you getting the message? Without the sprinkling of blood, there's not only no remission, but without the sprinkling of the blood, there's no fire of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's go on to the crucifixion, shall we? The fulfillment of the high priest presenting and sprinkling his own blood. Jesus Christ was, had his beard plucked off. The blood began to flow. Then they took him into Pilate's judgment hall. They stripped him. Incidentally, if you've ever seen a picture of Jesus Christ on the cross, you've never seen a correct one yet. Never. He didn't have a loincloth. He became naked that you might be clothed upon with his righteousness. Totally naked and in a condition of total shame. They stripped him. They gave him 39 lashes. And tradition tells us that the bits of skin that were ripped out of his back by the bits of lead in the, in, in the, uh, in the cords, the sparrows came through the open windows and picked up these pieces of skin and took them away. His back was lacerated and was flowing with blood. Then they took him and they put on a crown of thorns. Now, if you've ever been to Israel, they showed me the thorn. It's like one of those old-fashioned darning needles, about two to two and a half inches long. And if we are not exceeding plausibility, I'm going to suggest there were as many as 20 of these long thorns in this crown of plaited thorns. And they didn't put it on reverently, brother. They jabbed it on his head. Now, anybody knows, the moment you have a scalp wound... It bleeds profusely. It usually runs down, on, runs down your face, and before you can quench it, it reach right down to your chin and dripping on your blouse. Well, now, just imagine having 20 of those with a heart strongly pumping blood. The blood would have started to run down his face, run down his beard, run down the back of his hair, run down his back. Then they made him carry the cross, and finally, when he got to Calvary, they nailed him to a tree. I went through this with you the other day, 
saying it was a, a beautiful carpenter's cross, it was a tree. And then they nailed eternal life to the tree, which spoke of eternal death, a dead tree. And then they drove spikes through his wrists and through his ankles. And the strong heart would pump the blood out. And all the time, the blood was being sprinkled from his hands. Because in one of the cases in the Old Testament, the priest used to take the, the blood with his finger and sprinkle it seven times. Well, Jesus sprinkled the blood perfectly. That's what seven times means, with his own fingers. The blood dripping down to the ground, dripping down his arms, dripping down his naked body. And then, according to the Old Testament, it says not one of his bones will be broken. That's in Psalm 34. I think it's also a bit in Zechariah. And in order that, that his, we should be absolutely no doubt in future generations that this man who said he'd die and would rise again was dead. A Roman soldier stuck a sword into the cardiacal sac and all the rest of the blood, white corpuscles and red corpuscles associated with heart and life came out. There wasn't a drop of human blood left in that body. And I want you to understand, friends, that this blood, though it was human blood, was also God's blood. That's the mystery of the incarnation. It was God's blood put into his son. It didn't have a normal category. That's why the Apostle Peter calls it precious blood. Precious blood. It didn't have category A1 or B1 or RH negative. It was a, an isolated type of blood, it was God's blood, and it cannot be duplicated, and that blood right now is on the earthly seat in heaven. And it's pleading for us. It's pleading mercy, pardon, and forgiveness for this my child who takes that blood and honors that blood. That's why in, in Hebrews we read the blood of Jesus Christ speaker, better things than Abel. What did Abel's blood say? Cried out from the ground and said, Vengeance! For the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't cry out from the ground, it cries out from heaven. And when we identify ourselves with this blood which is on the mercy seat in heaven, and we say, Lord Jesus, by faith, I take your precious blood, and I sprinkle your precious blood on the lintel and doorpost of my heart. I put it on my ear, my thumb, and my toe. I put it upon my children. I put it upon all that you've given to me. I cover them with the atonement. When... Jesus Christ was put on the cross. When the cross was clumsily bumped into this hole in Calvary, God did a remarkable thing. He turned the light out. The sun went out. You know, it says the same thing is going to happen when Jesus Christ comes back again. Get ready. The whole earth was filled with total darkness. That must have scared the daylight out of the people. Never been known before. Can you imagine today with all our television and radio and everything else, suddenly, I mean, you heard enough about Mount Washington or Mount, that Mount, uh, volcano in Washington State blowing up, but can you imagine what would happen if suddenly God turned the light out and all over the world reports came that it was totally dark, the moon had withdrawn her shining, the stars had withdrawn the shining, and the sun had, had withdrawn its shining. Why can you talk about people being scared? And that's what's going to happen. Hallelujah. Do you know, you know, I mentioned to you the other day that a lot of people think that Jesus Christ couldn't possibly break through the clouds in Arizona because there are no clouds there. Well, he's wrong. I've been there when there have been clouds. But, in, you see, I've mentioned to many of these enthusiastic Pentecostal people. You know, you can be enthusiastic. You can, you can have, a, a, you can have a, a feel of God without a knowledge of God. And I said, do you know that in the Zechariah it says it will be a day of cloud and gloom all over the world? The sun will be even obscured? Well, Zechariah 14 and 6, I think it is, but it's 4 or 6. It says so. But people don't know their Bible. And I've heard all kinds of rubbish about the coming of Jesus Christ. I'm sure you have too. But when he comes through, it'll be a day of darkness for three hours. For three hours. What a spooky experience. He said on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What did he mean? It's mentioned in Psalm 22, repeated for us in Matthew's Gospel. Could the Father, eternally coexistent with the Son, turn his back on the Son? Yes. And this was the hardest part 
of Christ's suffering. To have been eternally sinless, to have been eternally one with the Father, and have placed upon him all your dirty rotten sins, all your dirty rotten sicknesses, all your dirty rotten disposition, your foul temper, your rotten behavior, your carnal behavior, all put upon the body of Jesus in an instant of time. How would you have felt? You don't know. You never will know. It says in the book of Habakkuk, or Habakkuk to Americans, I don't know why, it says, God will not look upon sin, and God will not look upon your sin, unless it's on the body of his son. And so what did Jesus do for three hours on the cross when it was all black? He covered your sins and your sicknesses in his own blood. At the end of that three hours, whether you looked at front, back, sideways, whichever way, you would have seen a naked man literally covered in his own blood, his own sacrifice, his own atonement. Underneath that blood were your sins. So the father turned three hours later and looked upon his son and received his son as the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Then they took him and they buried him just beneath Mount Calvary in that tomb there if any of you have seen it. Most spectacular. I've been in that tomb. And there they laid him. You know what happened? Even the Roman soldiers had heard the stories about so they set a guard of Roman soldiers over the stone so that nobody could touch it. Because the man said he was going to rise again and they were going to put a lie to that. But they forgot about God. He said a couple of angels. The whole place was filled with the glory of God. The Roman soldiers got up and ran. They'd never seen anything like it before. And Jesus came out of his tomb, alive. Then he wasn't in a wheelchair. He wasn't carried on on a stretcher by the two angels. He came out resurrected on his own feet. Then he ascended to the Father. Then he sprinkled his own blood upon the mercy seat of heaven. Then he was returned. Then he met the two on the road to Emmaus. You know, weren't they dumb, those two guys? Weren't they dumb? All the prophecies said, I'm going to die. Three days I'm going to raise, be raised up again. I'm going to rebuild the temple. And they heard all these things, but they understood not what he said. Why? Just like us. All kinds of things that he says to us in the Bible, we don't understand. But you're dumb. But thank God, he's merciful with us. Gradually the Holy Spirit takes the veil of our dumbness away and we see through a glass darkly. But then, face to face. Hallelujah. You couldn't stand looking at Jesus today. You'd drop dead. Straight line upon line, precept upon precept, looking through a glass darkly, awaiting the great, great day of his coming in the clouds. Well, there's a lot more that can be said about it, but I have to sort of cut it short a little bit. Let's go into the book of Hebrews. I've already mentioned there in the book of Hebrews about you sprinkling the blood of Jesus at your communion upon your heart from an evil conscience. Let's go into Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 is the most interesting portion here, reading from 18 to 22, with a few commentaries. Whereupon... Neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Now this is a strange thing. On the Day of Atonement, which of course only happened once a year, and on the Day of Atonement the Lamb of God at the exact time was crucified. The Day of Atonement, which means the Day of the Covering. The day of the covering of your sins and my sins. So on the day of atonement, which was an annual festival in, 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 in Israel, the lamb would be slain, the bullock would be slain, and then the priest would take the fleshly shed blood from off the altar, would put a bunch of hyssop in it, he'd go through the congregation who got on their freshly laundered garments, they'd take their sandals off at the door of the church, the women had head, head, uh, head, uh, kerchiefs on their head, and he would go and he would splash this blood without, he would sprinkle it like this, right, left and center, and people would get in the way of it. And they'd have their faces splashed, their head coverings splashed, their beautifully laundered garments splashed, and they'd go out of that special day of atonement service splashed and sprinkled with the blood of the sacrificial lamb. 
And as they put their uh, sandals on at the door, they'd walk back to their, uh, their meal on the Sabbath day, and they would look at each other, and one Aunt Mary would have a large splat of bullock's blood in her eye, and Aunt Joan would have one in her ear, and Uncle Tom would have it all over his head, and Uncle Bill's skirts would be dropping with blood, and they'd all be praising the Lord, saying, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Our sins are forgiven for another whole year. Well, then on the same day, he did a most desecrating thing. You know, these ancient scrolls, they were all written out by hand on parchment. And probably it would take the best of a year for one priest to write out the book of Isaiah alone. And here were these beautiful scrolls. And the high priest would take the scroll, which he's going to read the scriptures, relating to the Day of the Atonement in the law. And he comes, his fellow, he'd get a bunch of uh, hyssop, he'd dip it in the blood, and he'd go, whoosh, right across the Bible. Because Jesus Christ is the living Word of God. And Jesus Christ's Word is not released from him until he shed his blood. That's why you don't have any gifts of the Spirit until after his death, which are silver trumpets and tinkling bells, all sounding out. Incidentally, if any of you use the gifts of the Spirit in this auditorium, see it's like a sounding trumpet everybody can hear. Will you? I've heard too much mumbling, you know, wood, 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 like this. Nobody knows what you're talking about. The gifts of the Spirit must never be used unless everybody can hear and be edified by the word that is spoken. Okay? That's good teaching on the gifts. And so the book, typifying the living word of God, the Logos became a living book instead of an old dead theological letter where they get the, some of the Bible out in the theological seminaries across our country and discuss a little of it and then give you a lot of psychology and a lot of humanism. Shall I tell you why they do that? Because they don't understand it. They couldn't teach it anyhow because they wouldn't understand it. It's only as we apply the blood to the book that we begin to understand it. And then when the, the blood is mixed with the oil, let me read you that scripture to show you what I mean. Uh, so much to say, as you will conceive, but we're managing all right. Let's turn to Exodus 29. I haven't read that scripture. <clears throat> Exodus 29. This also includes the teaching about putting the blood upon the ear, thumb, and toe. But it also, if I've got the right reference, and I think I have, uh, it includes very interesting uh, information. Exodus 29, and verse 21. And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar, and of the anointing oil. Now you know the anointing oil speaks of the Holy Spirit. And you'll see both in Deuteronomy 14, where, where we're at, Leviticus 14, and Exodus 29, the same thing is repeated. The blood is mixed with the oil, or the oil is mixed with the blood. You will take of the anointing oil and sprinkle it, the anointing oil, on the blood on Aaron. Now the moment that Jesus Christ shed his spirit, correct, shed his blood, and died on the cross of Calvary, at that moment he released the Holy Spirit to come 50 years, 50 days later. And do you know why 50 days later? Because 50 in the Bible speaks of, speaks of uh, full redemption. The fullness of redemption. Because the law of Jubilee was 50 years in Leviticus 25. The law of Jubilee was that after 50 years, all debt were to be forgiven, and every house in, in, of the Israelites was to be restored with its land, with its property, with its soul, because they spent their money so foolishly like people do today. Got debt. Probably they had credit cards. I don't know. Now, at the end of 50 days, the number 50, God restored the fullness of his spirit to his church, which is the body of Christ. And at that moment, they receive their full inheritance. Let me turn with you to Ephesians. We'll close in about five minutes, but I'm bringing in some extra thoughts today because it, it, to me it's so beautiful to know what our inheritance is. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 and 14. This is what happened to you when you received your personal Pentecost. This is what happened to you when you spoke in tongues because Jesus Christ mixed the oil with the blood. In whom you also trusted after 
That you heard the word of truth. You have to hear the preaching first. The gospel of your salvation. Okay? So you get saved by hearing the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in whom also, after that you believe, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The shedding of the blood which brought you salvation at conversion now brought you the baptism of the Spirit, which in verse 14 is described as the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession until the praise of his glory. And so all the time from conversion until the coming of Jesus Christ, you have a progressive inheritance. And more and more and more are we beginning to learn today what our inheritance really is, what freedom really means, what bondage we've been in, what a mess we've been in, what sickness and sin we've been in. It, it always, I never cease to be amazed when in a place like this I see so many people getting delivered. Well, what were they doing before? What were they doing before? What were their pastors doing before? They were giving them communion full of demons. Do you realize that? Some of them. It's an astonishing thing. It's a revelation that frankly blows the night's natural man, mind's man, man's mind. He doesn't know what we're talking about. How can a Christian have a demon? Well, they're beginning to learn a little bit because we're kind of entering into the fuller and fuller and fuller of this inheritance, which continues until the coming of Christ. Isn't it amazing? Well, then one final scripture. To show you how the, the theme of the blood goes all the way through from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, there's two verses here which I may as well mention while in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. And they, who's the they? All Christians of all ages from the cross until now. Don't you start taking all the promises in the book of Revelation and putting them into three and a half years in the future because you can't find that in the Bible to do that. And they overcame him. Hallelujah. Who's him? Satan and all his demon force. They overcame him by or by means of literal Greek. They had to use it by means of the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Then we see another picture of this group in Revelation Revelation 7 and verse 13 and one of the elders answered and said unto me what are these or better who are these which are arrayed in white robes I like that no spots no wrinkles no, nothing on them at all no dirty food stains no murder blood washed white in the blood of the Lamb these are they on which came they these are they verse 14 which came out of great tribulation. Do you know that every generation of the Christian church has had its own tribulation? Even in the Pentecostal times, some years ago, of the Assemblies of God, USA, which is very futuristic in its outlook, it said the people of China are not looking for a great tribulation. They got it. The people of Uganda are looking for another tribulation. They had it. The people of Vietnam and Cambodia are not looking for a tribulation, brother. They got it. You say, well, there's one coming on America. Who says so? Come on, I challenge you. Who says so? Find it in the Bible and show me. I'll tell you plenty about America that you probably you don't know. Do you realize, my friends, that if America went down the pan, correct, pardon the expression, if, if America went down the drain, the rest of the world would go down the drain. Do you realize that, and I may, I've mentioned this to several brothers, and I'll mention it now before I close. In the 49th chapter of Isaiah, of Genesis, the Genesis of things, and you can, I want you to turn to it because you won't believe me if you don't. And you know, the book of Genesis tells all about the work of the favorite son, Joseph, and how he fed all the other nations of the world. Do you remember that? Now, Joseph is a type. And what is mentioned in typology in the book of Genesis has to have its fulfillment now. And I'll tell you why. Because in the 49th chapter of Genesis, read the first verse, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Come on now. Is that right? Is that what it says? Well, what happens to Joseph in the last days? We know what happened to Judah. Judah gave birth to the Son of God. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. 
We know that. That's historical. It's factual. But there's another good one about Joseph. The fruitful bough in verse 22. Even a fruitful bough by a well with branches that run over the wall and expanding, emigrating people. And then it says of Joseph, verse 24, and I like this. Verse 23, we'll read it all. The archers have surely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. Who hates, him, who hates the United States of America most today? All the other nations of the world, including Iran. Absolutely hate them. They just, just drop bombs on them. If they could, Russia would just blow the United States into oblivion if they could. But they can. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the mighty hand, by the hand of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence, from Joseph, is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Huh? I thought you said, <coughs> the stone came from Judah. No, he was born of Judah. But he was manifested of Joseph. The double portion tribe. Now, where's Joseph? Which nation in the world is the wealthiest nation in the world with the potential to feed the world. Come on now, be honest. And don't forget to join Canada with it, will you? It's Canada and the United States. Now look, and I'm serious. I believe the prophecies of, jo of Joseph, however you work it out, whether you say the people of America are linear the descendants of Joseph, or whether it's a type of Joseph, doesn't matter. The people in the United States of America represent Joseph in the world today. What's the duty of Joseph in his final form? To be elevated to supreme power and authority under the world system called Pharaoh of Egypt, and then to feed all the other nations of the world with the gospel and with food. Do you realize, my friends, right now, that every year when you get a bumper crop, the United States government has to cut, cut back the crop of corn in the Middle Western states because they're overabundant. And they have to tie it to the financial system. So God says, all right, in order that America and Canada may feed the world, I'll bust the financial system. And then you'll go and you'll sow, and they're now getting 150 bushels per acre. You'll be getting 250 bushels per acre very soon, when God begins to shine on this by the Holy Spirit. And America will have so much food that you'll be able to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, which is the practical formation of the gospel. You have no need to save up for food when America will have so much food it's going to give it away. Now, I mean that with all my heart. And I can say, thus saith the Lord. God has got a peculiar people for a peculiar ministry. If America went down the drain, the rest of the world would go down drain with America, including Russia. My friends, the purpose of Jesus is the same. God so loved the world that he gave. Remember that. God loves the Chinese. And you know already, facts and figures have been brought out to tell us that by the year 2000, if we get there, 85% of all the blacks in Africa will be born again Christians. Now in the meantime, before Jesus comes, this tremendous outpouring of the Spirit, it's going to hit from North America to South America, it's going to hit back into Europe. It's going to go into China. One third of the population of the world exists in China. And God has now removed, taken back the communist veil after communism has destroyed every heathen religion in America. And God is still going to destroy Mohammedanism. You're going to see Iran go down the drain. That silly Ayatollah out there called President Carter the devil. He got it the wrong way around. You see, my friend, God did not establish the church for fun. God established the church to bless the world. And you can look into India if you want. You can go in Africa if you want. And you can look for the fulfillment of Joseph. But I tell you, there's only one place in the world that can fulfill Joseph. It's, it's Canada and the United States. Now think it over. Don't say I'm talking heresy. Think it over. We are dealing with a people that's full of fear at what's coming to pass on the earth. And Jesus said, don't look that way, look that way. That's where our redemption comes from. You shouldn't be afraid of what's coming. You should glorify in what's coming. Because what's coming is that we will more and more be children of light. We'll be healed without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. We'll grow with the glory of God. We'll have far more possessions than we can even know what to do with. So we'll give it away. Listen, friends. Ever since, and I've lived long enough to have gone through two world wars and one great depression. 
And all the people are doing today is talk about what happened in the Great Depression, when the stock market fell. Well, as soon as the stock market falls, the better. That will make way for the, for the largest and abundance of God to fall. Ever since the Second World War, America has been going into progressive prosperity. And a lot of the European countries have too. Scandinavia, Switzerland, uh, even Italy. And I've visited all these nations. They're all going into increasing prosperity. In Scandinavia, you find the same number of cars and the same number of washing machines and the same number of refrigerators, the same number of radios and the same number of televisions all over the world and the Western nations in particular. God has been pouring out blessings. You say, well, the people are, are worshipping the God of materialism. I know. But God still loves them. And the church is multiplying. Every day it's multiplying. There are 75 million people in the United States today who believe that Jesus Christ is their Savior. And you go back, this is an extra by the way, and you go back a little time, back to Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham said, Lord, would you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for 50 here? No. 40? No. 35? No. 20? No. 10? No. God would not have destroyed the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah if there had been 10 righteous men there, but there weren't. There's 95 million righteous men in the United States. It is impossible on the word of God for God to allow the United States to be destroyed. You say, well, God ought to judge them. Who are you, God? I say God ought to love them. And he does. Stop talking about judgment. And get on with blessing the people. God not only wants to bless you more and more and more. He said, I'll bless your wine and your oil and your gas. And, uh, and, uh, I nearly said your gas. The, uh, your, 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 your corn and your wine and your oil and your gas and your... You know what he said he'd do that? At the same time as he poured out his spirit in the latter rain, he said he would do that. Where the church is strongest, the nation will be strongest. It is absolutely impossible for communist Russia to overthrow the United States. It's absolutely impossible. You see what I mean? Even if they have ten to one in armaments, it's absolutely impossible. Because if they overrun the United States, the church will perish, you know it would. And if the church perish, that's why God's going to make the church more and more prosperous. Just finish it with old Joseph. Joseph said, okay, you nation, if you want our wheat, cut and corn, you bring your donkeys and your sacks up to us, we'll fill them up for you, and you hand us over the money. And that money belonged to Pharaoh. And at the end of the seven years' famine, Pharaoh owned all the land of Egypt. I've got news for you, friends. The church is going to be finished up owning all the wealth of the world before Jesus comes. That fulfills the complete prophecy of Joseph, and we are the Joseph people. Never mind whether you, you think you're linearly descended or not, that's not important. We're not dealing with that now. We're dealing with the spiritual mission that God has given to the church in America, and it is Joseph from then, from then, is the stone of Israel. That's Jesus Christ. Now, have I helped you at all? Be gone, despair. Be gone, fear. Look up. Your redemption, your buying back, is taking place now. And God is going to prosper you, because whatsoever he doeth, come on, sing the psalm, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Does it say it? And he that sitteth in the heavens, yes, psalm, when the kings of the earth take action, they say, we will destroy the sun on the throne. Jesus sits one look at them from heaven and has a belly laugh. He laughs and he laughs and he laughs and he holds them in derision. Because he said, I've set my king in Zion. The stone is there. The stone is there. And it's coming out of Joseph right now. To bless every nation under the world before Jesus comes. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com or lhbconline.com There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.